Surely, at this point, you've seen Imperial Yeast's amazing selection of high-quality brewing yeasts over at imperialyeast.com. But you might not be as familiar with Imperial Yeast's special order yeast bank. In addition to their tried-and-true core strain selection, Imperial Yeast has a number of ale or lager strains, Britannomyces, Kvike, and other yeasts available for special order. If you're looking to match a yeast strain currently in production or just looking for something new to play with in the brew house, reach out to Imperial Yeast Customer Service to see what they may have in store. Special Special order strains are subject to a 10 liter order minimum and require a two to three week propagation time, but they might just be what you're looking for for your next brew. You can get more information about Imperial Yeast's special order strains by calling 503-477-5826 or emailing service at imperialyeast.com. Welcome to the Brew Lab. Sour beers have a pleasant acidity that derives from several types of organic acids, usually lactic and acetic acid. And while lactic and acetic acid fermentations usually take place after primary fermentation, many modern sour brewing practices have yeast being pitched directly into pre-soured wort. I'm your host, Kate Job, and today in the lab, I'm speaking with Avi Shayevitz, R&D research scientist at Lalamond, and we're talking about how lactic and acetic acid in pre-soured wort might impact fermentation performance. So Avi ran about a half dozen strains from Lalamond's active dry yeast collection to see how they fare in different concentrations of lactic and acetic acid, looking at things like attenuation, how well does the yeast consume fermentable sugars, speed of fermentation, of course, the actual concentration of organic acid acids present, uh, pH and total acidity, uh, but he also did some analyses on the actual sugars that are left in the wort after the yeast is in the beer after the yeast is done fermenting. Um, some takeaways, some yeast are actually impacted by the levels of lactic and acetic acid present in wort, so that's a pretty big takeaway. But again, one of the more interesting findings to me from this study is the sugar analysis. So without giving away too many spoilers, the presence of acid affects some yeast ability to take up sugars and turn it into alcohol, specifically maltotriose. So some yeast's ability to control maltotriose is impacted by the presence of lactic or acetic acids. Pretty cool results. We'll dive into why that is and get some more results in just a few minutes. We're nearing the end of the year, which for me is a time of reflection and thankfulness. I'm grateful for all of the team here at Brewlosophy, everything that we've been able to accomplish here in 2022, the support that we receive from our listeners, and of course, our patrons. So becoming a patron is a fantastic way to support the work that we do. If you haven't yet considered becoming a patron, please go take a look at patreon.com slash brewlosophy. Once you're there, you'll see that there are a variety of awards available to you based uh, of rewards available to you based on different pledge levels for as little as a few bucks a month. You can get access to Brewlosophy contributor recipes that we've never before published, new discounts each month to yakimavalleyhops.com, and uh, at the $3 level, access to a monthly live Q&A session with a special guest from the brewing industry. And once you become a Patreon or a patron, you get access to all of the previous guest recordings. It's an absolute treasure trove of information. In addition to helping helping support us uh, in bringing you an experiment and a secondary series article and two podcasts each week, your support through Patreon helps keep all of this going. So thank you to all of those who have already joined. And if you haven't, please consider it by visiting patreon.com slash brewlosophy. The other great way to support us during the holiday season is to use the affiliate links listed at brewlosophy.com slash support when doing your online shopping. It's such an easy way to support us and it doesn't impact your shopping experience at all. You just start with the link, then we get a small kickback from your purchases. You can check out all of our affiliates at brewlosophy.com slash support. Feedback is brought to you by the folks from John I. Haas, who over the last couple years have released a handful of really cool hot products like like Lupamax, Incognito, and Flex, all intended to improve beer while reducing vegetal matter and thus increasing yields. Well, they're excited to announce their latest 100% hop-derived product, especially made for your patio, lawnmower, or beach beers, Kettle Ready imparts smooth, light-stable bitterness and kettle hop aroma to beer while offering microbiological protection during the brewing process. This new product is easy to use and has no special dosing requirements. Plus, due to its standardized high alpha acid concentration in a light stable molecule, it gives the light stability and bitterness characteristics desired for all traditional beers. And it plays well with other Haas products, including Tetra Hop Gold, Hexa Hop Gold, and Ready Hop for flexibility and optionality when brewing light stable beers. Learn more about Kettle Ready at johnihaas.com. That's john, the letter I-H-A-A-S.com. 
All right, listener, Chris wrote in with feedback about episode 89 with Dr. Lance Shainer about olive oil and oxygenation. He says, hi, Cade. As I listened to the experiments you discussed in episode 89, the thought that kept popping up was how much oxygen was already present in the worts without artificial aeration or oxygenation. I think a simple experiment that would be very helpful to home brewers would be to brew a basic wort using common home brewing methods, mashing, boiling, and cooling. The level of dissolved oxygen in the just cooled wort before transfer would be measured. The wort would be split in three equal amounts and tested again in three common situations. In wort that was simply transferred into a fermenter with some splashing, in wort that was transferred and per- purposefully agitated, such as vigorous stirring or shaking, or in wort that was transferred and had oxygen added with an oxygen stone. Another option would be to test the levels between adding oxygen with a stone against one of the homebrew level inline oxygenation kits. If those three worts were then fermented with a slurry of the same yeast and conditions, the resulting fermentation profiles and sensory review might be interesting as well. Even so, just predicting the levels of dissolved oxygen a homebrewer might expect from these simple methods would help inform decisions about whether oxygenation is needed at all. And if so, what equipment or method is worth investing time and money in? Thanks for the variety of material you cover. Chris. Hey, Chris, thank you. Yeah, um, yeah, you got it. I mean, that this that was one of the biggest questions about uh, this whole episode. The question is how much oxygen was present in the worts, or more importantly, um, how much ergosterol was already present, or were the yeast able to assimilate based on the oxygen that was present? Um, and in every experiment, I mean, Dr. Shainer or Lance mentioned this quite a few times, that in every experiment, there was either oxygen or ergosterol present. Um, and he suggested the only way to truly test whether olive oil could be substituted would be to take it out several generations with no oxygen ingress at all, uh, which would be de- very difficult. Um, with respect to your question for for homebrewers, like how much oxygen can you anticipate getting into wort? Um, that's a really interesting one. I'd love to see that. I'd love to see somebody do that and measure the oxygen in it. Um, although I'm sort of suspicious about whether or and to the ex- and the extent uh, that uh, that oxygenation uh, impacts your wort. We've done a number of oxygenation experiments at Brewlosophy. I encourage you just go to brewlosophy.com um, and type in oxygen, you'll see like we did one where we directly added oxygen to a British golden ale versus no oxygen. We did over oxygenating a New England IPA. Uh, we did two ox- two doses of oxygen um, in an imperial stout. We did a shaken fermenter versus no oxygen in a cream ale. There's a whole lot um, of experiments. Again, just go to brewlosophy.com and search oxygen. Um, and, you know, the results are mostly on the thumb of the oxygen didn't seem to matter. Now, again, brewlosophy does suffer for, or not not suffer, but brewlosophy does have uh, the, the direct pitch of uh, imperial yeast. So the yeasts are also he- already healthy whenever we pitch them. Um, we do have uh, some plans to do uh, generational experiments in the future, but those just haven't come out yet. Um, so I'd say that's where we're probably going to see more impacts of oxygen. Uh, But yeah, if you're interested in knowing the exact amount of oxygen that's getting into your wort, I'd also encourage you to go look back at episode, um, I I should have written down the number, but I didn't, but it's the episode with Luis uh, Luis Castro, uh, the Brew Lab episode, where we talked about oxygenating big beers, the impact of oxygenation um, in high gravity brewing. So I'd encourage you to go back um, and and check that out as well. But thanks for the awesome question, um, and thanks for the feedback, Chris. All right, I'm going to go take a quick break, and then I'll be back with Avi Shevitz talking about the impact of lactic and acetic acid on brewer's yeast. One of the biggest improvements to my brewing practices was the upgrade to stainless steel, and Delta Brewing Systems offer some of the lowest prices on high-quality stainless gear, like the Firm Tank, which holds 8 gallons or 30 liters of wort, comes with a domed lid to reduce the chances of a messy blow-off, and it can hold up to 4 PSI of pressure. Delta Brewing Systems also has their own line of brew kettles, as well as one of the lowest-priced all-in-one electric brew systems out there, and their prices are remarkably affordable. If you're in the market for legit stainless gear, that won't break the bank, you've got to check out DeltaBrewingSystems.com. Looking for a fun way to win up to 25 times your money this basketball season? Test your skills on Prize Picks, the most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. Just select two or more players, pick more or less on their projected stats, and place your entry. You could turn $10 into $250. Right now, Prize Picks will match your first deposit up to $100. Just visit PrizePicks.com slash fan and use code FAN. That's code FAN at prizepicks.com slash FAN. Must be present in certain states. Visit prizepicks.com for restrictions and details.
Sour beers derive most of their sour flavor from bacteria that produce organic acids like lactic acid and acetic acid, which can be poisonous to brewer's yeast at high enough concentrations. The question is the extent. How much acid and which yeast strains are most severely impacted? So here with me in the lab to answer these questions is Avi Shaivitz, R&D research scientist at Lalamont. So Avi, welcome back to the Brew Lab. Hey, Cade. Thanks for having me. Yeah. I'm, uh, listeners, you'll remember, Avi, from way back, uh, episode 15 of the Brew Lab, where we talked about the barrel micro and mycobiome. But Avi, why look at organic acids and sour beers? So that's um, that's a really good question. As most people are probably familiar with, lactic acid plays a big role in beers such as beer styles like, like Gosa's and Lambic's. Um, so one of the things, the traditional methods or some of the traditional methods used, um, and I say traditional because these are, you know, 150 years old, um, methods that are used for producing sour beers usually requires a pre-fermentation or a uh, pre-primary fermentation with lactic acid bacteria to produce a lot of lactic acid before the primary alcohol fermentation, as opposed to say like acetic acid where that generally takes place post-fermentation. Yeah, that makes sense, right? Acetic acid happens usually like in a barrel where there's oxygen ingress. Yeah. yeah. Right. Because if and I guess as we'll talk about, um, that's something that I learned. But uh, the uh, in a microbiology class, um, actually, Dr. Curtin's microbiology class, who is your advisor, I believe. Right. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, I, yeah so I, uh, I learned that acetic acid requires oxygen or acetic acid yes. bacteria requires it. So um, but we, we might touch on that a little bit, but we'll get in through there. So that makes a lot of sense, right? You want to look at this like, OK, in sour beer production, like what is that? What are these acids, lactic acid and, and acetic acid actually doing to brewer's yeast, right? Yep. All right. Well, um, before we hop into that, just a little uh, reminder. So, well, actually, not a reminder. Avi got a promotion since last time uh, we were uh, he was on the <laughs> podcast. Uh, he's now R and D research scientist uh, at Lalamond and uh, got his master's in food science and technology at Oregon State University. Um, so, what's been going on since we last spoke? Any new fun projects? Uh, yeah. Yeah. So. Quite a few things have been going on behind the scenes. Um, I would love to be able to talk about them, but <laughs> fortunately, some of this stuff I got to kind of keep under lock and key for now. Right, but right. one of the big things that we've recently done um, was the launch of our Nova Logger, which is a completely lab created hybrid. Um, it is it is genetically. Uh, a Saccharomyces pastorianus, but it was kind of like a very guided, um, very forced breeding. Uh, yeah. So this is uh, created entirely using um, non-GMO techniques. So it's not a GMO yeast. Um, it is a what we kind of tentatively call a type three logger. <laughs> okay. So you know how you have your type one and your type two, your saws and your Frobergs. Mm-hmm. Uh, so this is this is type three. And it's actually, um, it's super interesting because this is um, specifically created to um, significantly reduce hydrogen sulfide production during oh. um, uh, logger fermentation, which should translate to faster maturation times. Um, but the other really interesting thing is, is that while well, it's still a lager, it's actually very um, temperature tolerant. So, oh, uh, interesting. you know, it'll it'll grow and ferment all the way up to 37 degrees Celsius. Whoa, uh, okay. So 96.8, <laughs> uh, <laughs> 97 degrees uh, Fahrenheit, yeah. um, which well, I would, generally I don't recommend making a <laughs> lager at 37 <laughs> degrees, but, uh, you know, it, it'll um, it'll survive the uh, spikes in temperature like so. Yeah, that's cool. Well, that's fun. We're going to have to get you back on the show um, to talk about that. Uh, we just did an episode a couple of weeks back with uh, Matt Winans at Imperial where they did a, um, a, a hybrid of, uh, what is it, London 3 uh, juice and uh, their, their Kvike strain Loki. Um, which is cool. So yeah, it would be, I would love yeah. to get you back on to talk about a lager yeast strain that you've done. You call it, it's Nova Lager? Nova Lager, yeah. Well, cool. 
yeah, that that'll be a lot of fun. Um, we're gonna have to get to that. Uh, we'll 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 definitely have to get an episode on that because I want to hear about you know um your techniques for making hybrids and also the, what you can do with that yeast. So, uh, but for this episode, we are talking about more um you know on the sour side. I guess you can make sour lagers. Mm-hmm. I've certainly made sour lagers. Um, but we're trying to understand <laughs> how lactic and acetic acid impact alcohol fermentation with brewer's yeast. So, or really like stated differently, understand how a acidity impacts brewers yeasts right um Mm -hmm. and uh one of the uh big takeaways for me from this paper is hey yeast are actually surprisingly resilient (laughs) um, to these acids uh lactic acid more so than acetic acid acetic acid is a little bit more detrimental uh but we will definitely get into those things as we get into the episode um, but I wanted to start with some basic organic acid chemistry. So let's start with lactic and acetic acid. So what are they and where do they come from? Um, really good question. Um, <laughs> so when we're looking at two different, these two different types of organic acids, so, or, or, you know, organic acids, basically, they, they cover all kinds of acids. But, um, we won't go too deep into the chemistry, um, but... Biologically speaking, um, lactic acid plays a very important role in eukaryotic metabolism. This it's a very old, it's a very ancient metabolic pathway. Um, humans, our our cells, particularly our muscle cells, are able to produce lactic acid under fermentative conditions, like when we're in oxygen starvation, like during very heavy exercise, um, and uh, acetic acid is usually something or it's typically requires uh an oxidative metabolism so usually in the presence of oxygen and i say usually because um acetic acid can be formed under anaerobic conditions as long as there are some form or some species of ox or uh, electron acceptors that can uh, be used during that metabolic process. I see. But for the most part, at least in terms of like brewing fermentations, acetic acid is going to be going to require some, some oxygen. Yes. Yeah. Yep. yeah. Yeah. And, um, as you had mentioned earlier, um, that, yeah, it usually requires some kind of oxygen ingress. So some kind of micro oxid oxygenation, like we find in barrels. Right. Um, so very slow, but very steady kind of uh, oxygen ingress, usually at, at barrel seams, like either at the the bottom or the lids, um, or where there's imperfections in the staves at their joints. Yeah, 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 exactly. That's how acetic acid sort of sort of gets in. And, and so I, I guess are lactic and acetic acid, I, you kind of mentioned this, are lactic and acetic acid the only organic acids in beer? Uh, no, no, far from. Um, so as a lot of brewers probably are familiar with, like during fermentations, uh, your pH will drop. Uh, and this is normally caused by primarily carbonic acid. So uh, when CO2 reacts with water, um, you'll form carbonic acid. That's a major contributor to pH change, as well as other organic acids. So um, during normal metabolism, yeast are just spitting out all kinds of um, different organic acids um, that can impact the pH. So, you know, without getting too lost in the weeds, uh, yes, this, they're not the only organic acids or acetic and lactic acid aren't the only organic acids. There are dozens of other species of organic acids that do contribute to that pH drop as well as just naturally occurring uh, carbonic acid through normal metabolic functions. Yeah, yeah. And and it's interesting. You mentioned earlier the metabolic function that lactic acid is produced in, right? I mean, there are, there are a bunch of different... I mean, these are called organic acids because they're used by organisms um, to survive, right? In metabolic pathway, pathways. Um, I know. Uh, because, like, you can think of it as, like, uh, organic acid is, is just um, usually some kind of of organic compound, so a carbon-based compound with a hydroxyl group that loses oh, okay. its that can lose its hydrogen, as opposed to say a salt acid. So that is something like um, hydrochloric acid, uh, sulfuric acid, um, hydrofluoric acid. So those are like the very strong acids. So those have like complete dissociations because um, they're thought of 
uh, so uh, we call them salt acids because um, <clears throat> historically, like you could think of it as like um, it'll exist in the hydrogenated form until it comes into contact with, say, an aqueous solution like water, where they'll completely dissociate into their individual um, ions. So you have your hydronium ion and you have your, your, your say, like in the case of hydrochloric acid, your chlorine ion. Mm-hmm. Right. So, the, yeah, they, they donate their proton. That's what, um, you know, reduces the pH because pH is a measure of uh, the amount of, of, of uh, 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 hydronium ions that are released, right? Um, yeah. So, yeah. So we can kind of think of it as like ion activity of specifically the hydronium ions. Yeah, exactly. And, and so, well, back to sort of l- l- lactic and acetic acid. Why would brewers want lactic and acetic acid in their beer? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So those they contribute very distinct sensory characteristics. So you have your very, the way that we interact with these acids on a physiological level, um, our organo, organoleptic perception, so to speak, um, these have uh, either inherently pleasing or interesting properties. So, uh, you know, as, as humans, we kind of look for things that we enjoy or specific flavor uh, experiences. Um, that's why things like kombucha are oh yeah, so liked uh, because of that strong kind of acetic acid bite. Whereas like with organ or with a uh, lactic acid, you kind of have like that smooth round kind of mouthfeel to it where you kind of get this nice tartness at the right level. So what brewers are looking for are those, specific kind of uh, sensory experiences right yeah and well and especially in like you were talking about sour beers right i mean beers that Mm -hmm. that are going to have that little um spritz i always like to think of it i mean this is probably a better for for citric acid but i always like to think of it as spritzing lemon on a piece of fish you know um it just sort of elevates the whole experience the whole like you said organoleptic experience of the fish yeah Mm -hmm. Um, and so that's what brewers are trying to do. Now, do brewers' yeasts produce these acids? You said humans um, are capable of producing lactic acid, um, you know, in our muscles whenever we're over, whenever, you know, our cells are oxygen starved, like whenever we're on a, on like a heavy workout or something. But do brewers' yeasts produce lactic and acetic acid? Generally, no, uh, not, at least in not in any significant quantity Mm. um so saccharomyces cerevisiae will not naturally produce significant quantities of lactic acid or acetic acid um when you do find when you do find significant quantities of those in your beer unintentional that's usually indicative of some kind of contamination yeah like a bacteria or something yeah yeah or maybe or you know even like britannomyces so like some yeah some yeast will are capable of producing lactic acid like in detectable quantities, but usually with Saccharomyces cerevisiae, it tends to be more of say like a random side chemical reaction. Mm, I see. Yeah, not something that the yeast is actually producing, right? Because the, we talked about this metabolic pathway, right? I mean, there's there's the lactic acid pathway. I think Krebs cycle, or I think it's tricarboxylic acid. I think that's right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, pathway. <laughs> Yeah, the TCA <laughs> cycle. Um, but those are that's one metabolic pathway that you can use glucose through glycolysis to generate energy. Um, and that's one pathway that, that people do it. So when our cells, when we're oxygen starved, we can do that to uh, generate energy um, in addition to some other ways. Uh, you know, but then yeast doesn't do that. They have the Crabtree effect. So in the presence of sugars, they uh, produce alcohol and CO2. Um, you know, instead of using, uh, using lactic acid. So that's kind of an interesting, um, interesting aspect of this research, right? Uh, is that, uh, when we're looking at lactic acid and acetic acid, it's generally not coming from brewer's yeast, but brewer's yeast in sour beers have to deal with these acids. And I guess that's kind yes. of the ultimate question for your research, right? Is is how do brewers deal with these acids that, you know, um, that they're present? I mean, the environment could be highly acidic that they're present in, right? Correct. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's really, it's not so much whether or not they're producing these, it's, it's the physical presence of those acids um, in a fermentation environment uh, 
or in an industrial environment. Mm-hmm. And so for for beer production, we're kind of talking about, you know, I guess we'll I guess we could be talking about a couple of different things. Right. I mean, we're talking about sour beer, right, because that's going to be the the main place that these um, that yeasts are going to be in connection with sours. And like you were mentioning, um, you know, some souring processes require that you produce a huge amount of lactic acid up front before you do the alcoholic fermentation. So I think about like, for example, our process at Blue Owl, we were we were a sour mash brewery. Um, and so, uh, you know, whenever I worked there, it was you take the wort, you, um, you inoculate it with lactic acid bacteria and some other things, and it produces a lactic, uh, a sour wort that we then boil at hops to send it over to the fermenter and then pitch our yeast. Um, and it's certainly a stressful condition for yeast, right? Because yeast aren't used to operating. They like that pH in the, you know, four to five range, not the three that um, is present in a lot of uh, sour beers, right? Yeah, they, um, I mean, so that's that's one of the great things about fungus in general is uh, they are survivors. Um, this is a very, <laughs> they're, they're very tough um, and they can survive a very broad range of, uh, a very broad pH range. Um, so, you know, we can, we can see, we can observe fermentation happening with, with, uh, with brewers, he's specifically as far down as like pH at 2.5. Wow. Um, yeah. yeah, it's, 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 it's pretty amazing considering like how low a pH is. I mean, even like uh, in breweries that, that will acid wash their yeast, they're, they're bringing that pH down to, I don't know, like two, 2.5 and holding, holding that yeast there for, for a few hours to kind of kill off any, any organisms that shouldn't be there. That's, that's how resilient they are. But in that stage of their life cycle, they're generally in more of a, um, uh, more of a metabolic upkeep stage. So they're kind of like just sitting there kind of maintaining normal metabolic life functions to survive until they can get back into a nutrient rich condition. So that's a bit different than wanting to ferment at those pHs. So they'll kind of like go into like, I wouldn't say like hibernation, just more like maintenance mode. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. Right. But they're not going to be the the fermentation workhorse. Right. They're not going to be making beer at that at that pH or maybe not. Yeah. Right. Um, You know, and it's actually interesting. You write in the paper. uh, I think this is a quote from the paper. It says it has long been documented in the ethanol industry that the presence of lactic and acetic acid can negatively impact fermentation performance. Um, And so that's one of the questions I have is like, how do these acids impact brewer's yeast um so that quote specifically so when i talk about the ethanol industry at large that that includes um we're talking about wine uh spirits biofuel uh so the a lot of the work done on the physiological impact of these organic acids on yeast physiology has primarily been done by the biofuels industry and this is because for them um, they're looking at liters uh, of ethanol produced, you know, like, like or you know, liters per gallon, I guess, of or the or, yeah. maybe that's not the right terminology. I'm not into biofuels, industry, <laughs> right, right, right. But, no, it's all good. Um, but yeah. essentially, they they need to maximize the amount of ethanol that they get per gram of glucose, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. right? So for them, any drop in in efficiency can translate into a lot of money that's potentially not being made um, because you know these run on pretty tight margins so you need to maximize that efficiency so when we're looking at say biofuels or the distilling industry like yeah um, organic acids are very tightly controlled this is something that they care about a lot whereas like okay in the brewing industry Efficiency is important, but you know, uh, unless you're doing very high gravity brewing, you're not. Uh, you know, if you're off by a couple grams per liter of alcohol uh, in your in your final beer, um, <clears throat> yeah, you're not. You know, that's that's okay. <laughs> yeah, it, it's not gonna it's not gonna change the thing too much, right? Like a six point three yeah. versus six point five isn't gonna really cause all that much 
problem anymore. Yeah, and right? that's even within spec of the TTB regulations. I believe you right. can be plus or minus point zero or point three percent yeah. uh, from deviation from your label. So <laughs> yeah, um, now you know it is a big deal if like you're off by a a full percent and that can happen uh particularly like with stuck fermentations and this can be a big issue if you've already have like all of your labels printed out um so you know you, nobody wants to get hit by those fines nobody wants to have their product pulled by by the feds um because of something like that could mm-hmm. could like the the fermentation efficiency be impacted that much by the acids by like lactic or acetic acid uh surprisingly yes okay um but that's when you're dealing with concentrations of these acids that are beyond comfortable for her, for most people's <laughs> tastes. Okay. Um, that's like when you're seeing like up to say like 11, 10 to 11 grams per liter of lactic acid. Okay. Uh, and even, and even with like acetic acid, it doesn't really take much for us. We're very sensitive to acetic acid in terms of, of detection. It's a very low flavor threshold, uh, yeah, I know for me for sure. Uh, I'm not a huge fan of kombuchas um, and vinegars generally. Um, yeah. <laughs> you know, and so yeah, so acetic acid for me is one of those that I taste in beer, and I'm like, oh, it's there, but I'm I'm not I like it very very minimally. <laughs> but yeah, what, exactly. Some so people then, love it, but some people hate it. Exactly. So then, what is what would be a sort of normal concentration range for these acids in beer? Uh, I guess I could really only speak from my own sensory training, but for me, um, ranging between, say, four grams per liter to about six grams per liter of lactic acid is pretty comfortable. Uh, That's kind of like a a good range for a nice, refreshing sour, uh, but without it being, you know, enamel stripping or mouth puckeringly, uncomfortably sour. Um, That was one of the things that we dealt with with our with our GMO yeast, the Sour Vizier, mm-hmm. uh, because it is so efficient at producing lactic acid um, that, you know, if people people want 11, 12 grams per liter of lactic acid, that's great. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, blending down is also a really good option <laughs> for that. That's a good one. That's that's an interesting one. You bring up a good point, too. Sour Vizier is another episode that I want to get you on um, here to talk about, too, because I know you were involved in uh, the production of that yeast uh, as well. Um, and so, OK, you uh, you also write. Um, well, actually, I mean, well. Not necessarily sour vicier related, but I thought it might be a, se- a segue. But because you also write in here that dry yeast might be advantageous over slurries, and I just think of that because I think of sour vicier coming, or well, really most Lalaman yeast coming in, um, you know, the dried yeast pouches uh, or packs, mm-hmm. um, you know. Um, and so, why is that? Why would dry yeast be advantageous over yeast slurries? One of the things that is done during the production of dry yeast is that the yeast is actually tempered, um, essentially, to prepare it for the drying um, part of the production process. That's a very stressful process for the yeast uh, because at that point, the yeasts are already fairly dehydrated. You're, you're dealing with yeast that has been reduced down to perhaps 30% water by weight. Um at that point, and and we're talking like individual cells, so like the total. Um, I'm going to butcher this pronunciation because it's Finnish. But if you've ever handled, say, a product called uh, Sumahiva, okay, which it's basically yeast cake. Um, this is how it's a brand of baking yeast that's commonly sold in Finland and other um, Nordic countries as well, uh, or you know. In, in the Nordic countries as well, and Finland, um, that is, it's a yeast cake. It's, you just chop off a piece, kind of like cutting up a stick of butter and using that to make a bread. That's, at that consistency, um, the yeast is already kind of like in standby mode. It's almost in like a pseudo hibernation mode. We, t- we take it a step further and remove that remaining 30% water. So if you can imagine that consistency um, being brought down to 2 to 6% water by weight, uh, the yeast have to be prepared for that. So they have to be pretty tempered. Um, and one of the things that we've noticed is that comparing, say, propagated yeast, yeast that we have gone through um, 
say like a propagation from the dry stage versus just directly pitching dry yeast, uh, that kind of tempering gives the yeast a essentially a physiological edge to very stressful situations. Oh, maybe that's that's kind of the way I was thinking about it as you were talking through it. I was kind of like, okay, well, it seems like you know removing water from the yeast is very stressful on them, so they do some things to sort of protect themselves. I guess is a yeah. way, yeah. Right. And then okay, same thing with sour beer or like with a beer that's got a high concentration of lactic or acetic acid. If you're going to throw yeast into that, if they are already prepared for a stressful situation, it's kind of like I mean, I guess it's kind of like going out in the cold. Right. I mean, you live in Canada. It's kind of like going out in this. I, I don't know. I just always have this perception of Canada just being like covered in snow all the time. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm from Texas. Well, so. it, was, it was pretty chilly this morning. So. <laughs> but it's like going out into the cold and then, you know, taking your, you know, uh, taking your warm jacket and your mittens and, and you know, your uh, goggles, if you need them, a toboggan, you know, taking that and going out into the cold versus, you know, just going out in like shorts and a t-shirt shirt as you've been inside in the nice warm you know air condition or heating yeah right um and so that makes that i guess that makes a lot of sense to me so the yeast is tempered it's prepared for hostile conditions so that when it gets pitched into acetic acid or lactic acid um not directly acetic or lactic acid it gets pitched into sour beer that has a high concentration of those acids um <laughs> that it can that it can uh survive and and continue to ferment and but one of the things so what you wanted to understand from this study is you mentioned earlier that the ethanol industry, right, the biofuel industry is the one that's really focused on impacts with lactic acid and acetic acid, but sour beers are made, right? And sour beers are consumed. Yep. Um, and so you guys wanted to take a look at um, some of your yeast, Lalamond's yeasts um, from the Lalamond yeast culture collection, and then uh, run them through uh, some fermentations with different concentrations of lactic acid. So from like zero to 1% lactic acid, zero to a half a percent acetic acid, um, and then determine how well these beers uh, produce, right? How well they ferment in these sour fermentations. Um, and then also see if there's any strain specific variation, which I think is really cool. Um, and so I want to get into those research, those, those results. We'll talk about the methods and what all you looked at, the specific strains. Um, and we'll do that right after this break. We all know that designing recipes is really fun, and doing it well is so much easier with good software. We at Brewlosophy recently made the switch to Brewfather, and honestly, y'all, we could not be happier. Brewfather utilizes the latest technology to bring you the most robust cloud-based recipe design software that can be accessed anywhere, on your phone, tablet, desktop, and even offline. It also works seamlessly with numerous third-party devices to make it easier to monitor every step of your brew. I know change can be difficult, but trust me when I say you need Need to go to brewfather.app today to try it out for yourself. That's brewfather.app. Established in 1995, More Beer has been consistently serving the greater brewing community since the time's IPA was expected to be bitter and clear. And there are reasons they've stuck around so long. In addition to their massive product selection and excellent customer service, More Beer has locations on both the West and the East Coast of the United States, which translates into fast shipping times regardless of where you live. And when you spend more than $59, shipping is free. When you're in need of brewing ingredients and gear, there's no better option than morebeer.com, one of the most trusted shops on the planet. Looking for a fun way to win up to 25 times your money this basketball season? Test your skills on Prize Picks, the most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. Just select two or more players, pick more or less on their projected stats, and place your entry. You could turn $10 into $250. Right now, Prize Picks will match your first deposit up to $100. Just visit prizepicks.com/fan and use code FAN. That's code FAN at prizepicks.com/fan. Must be present in certain states. Visit prizepicks.com for restrictions and details. Obviously, sour beers are known for their sourness, a feature that's dependent on the acid level in the beer. And that mixture of acids and their concentrations is important. And depending on how high and which acids are present might negatively impact some of the fermentation characteristics of brewer's yeast. So, Avi, during the during the break, I was thinking um, you were on for episode 15 where we talked about barrel biomes. And now we're talking about sour beer, um, you know, <laughs> and then so I'm starting 
starting to think barrels, sour beer, lambics, American sours. Am I sensing a research interest for you, Avi? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. Maybe. And sour vicier, throw that in there too. I'm starting to think. Um, I'm, I'm painting a picture of the beers that you like to drink. <laughs> <laughs> I do enjoy a nice, a nice sour. Um, I, I, I mean, I'm a big fan of um, of those more belgian styles so nice a nicely blended lambic or i guess uh a rodenbach would be a really good example mm, of that yeah. i don't yeah. know there's just there's just something about it yeah some gooses or something yeah i mean i definitely there's definitely great examples um, of those belgian beers um, well, and so let's get into then the study. So, you know, um, I guess having this interest in sour beer, it makes sense that you wanted to look at and see, um, you know, how yeast, how different yeast strains are impacted. So uh, the first thing that you did was prepare some wort. Um, and I think uh, you you used uh, two different kinds of DME, but it was Breeze DME to 12 degrees Play-Doh or 1048 OG um, and just did this in one liter bottles and then added whatever acid concentration you you were going to use and we'll get to the acid concentrations in just a second but you used sparkling amber dme for the lactic acid batches and golden light dme for the acetic acid and i was curious when i was reading through the paper why the difference um for those two oh that's uh that's that's actually a really good question um because again i'll just kind of interject a little bit here because um one of the things one of the things that we have to take into consideration are are the fermentation conditions. So we have to make note of like any major differences between the two, um, because essentially, and we'll we'll touch on this a bit a little bit later. But like, really, we can only talk about like what we're observing on these conditions in the lab, and kind of hopefully be able to make a um, more of a broad prediction um of what we would expect to see like out in the wild really the functionally speaking the sparkling amber um uh, dme and the uh golden light dme are functionally identical uh the only difference is is like one is just um <clears throat> noticeably darker and it's not even a major difference on the love of bond scale it's we did this just for uh backup in case labels were lost or something ah, so it's a I quick see. visual assessment yeah. um but as far as ferment um as long as from as far as fermentability is concerned um total yeast available nitrogen and free amino acids uh they're pretty much identical so really it just comes down to appearance um and you know taste they do taste like the the sparkling amber is slightly roastier compared to the golden light, which is essentially just a two row extract. Mm. Um, but yeah, just for quick visual assessment. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, I appreciate that. I actually was doing um, a pH calibration, some pH meter calibration, and I realized, you know, like the different colors. There's the the pH 7 is yellow, the pH 4 is red, and the pH 10 is blue, <laughs> you know. And I was thinking about that. I was like, oh, well, this makes sense. I always just thought there was something that you added when you added, this is how naive I was about science, right? It's like you add the pH thing to it and it turns it yellow you add the ph thing to it and it turns it blue well yeah but that's because it's a color because they don't want you you don't want to have like three clear liquids in front of you at three different ph's and lose a label or forget which one is which it's very easy to just exactly look at it and see it so yeah i appreciate that um okay so the different concentrations that you did so for lactic acid you did a zero percent weight by weight um uh all the way up to one percent weight by weight that's a mm -hmm. lot of lactic acid one percent yeah. um <laughs> that's yeah that's 10 grams per liter that's, 10 grams uh, that's it's pretty sour yeah yeah that's gonna be pretty sour um and you did that in 0. 0.2 increments which makes sense right i mean just a, a nice linear scale um increase on on lactic acid um for acetic acid just zero to um 0. 0.5 weight per weight by 0.1 percent increments and i wanted to ask about that difference so why less acetic acid than lactic acid so this was a decision based on sensory perception uh, because we know that like past a certain point, you essentially get vinegar. Um, I, I, I would double check this. Like I wouldn't take 
my word is gospel, but even like the white vinegar that you get at the supermarket, that white distilled vinegar for use in cooking or cleaning even, I think that's a 2.5% acetic acid mix. So it's, it's fairly dilute to begin with. Um, so if you're getting up to 1% acetic acid, that's... Uh, <clears throat> I mean, you're getting into a very antimicrobial concentration. <laughs> yeah. uh, so at, at that point, um, we decided, and this was also based off of previous literature reviews and things like that, just to kind of see like what, historically speaking, what level of lactic acid would we, or sorry, acetic acid would we see in, um, say, like a Flanders red ale or something, yeah. uh, which are known for their high acetic acid content. Um <clears throat> as a stylistic choice or uh, say like malt vinegar. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 So, so yeah, those were kind of, uh, those increments were kind of, uh, and concentrations were chosen just based off of historical literature, uh, kind of seeing like, where would we rationally see upper concentrations? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and, and something else to keep in mind too, for listeners as we're going along through this, um, cause we're going to, we, we, there's, I, this is maybe not a spoiler, but maybe it's something to ponder as we go through our results. Uh, but lactic acid, um, versus acetic acid in terms of their, their, um, detriment to brewer's yeast in terms of how potent they are, um, uh, as, as compared to, to brewer's yeast, you know, I mean, is one worse than the other? Something to think about as we go through, um, the results, uh, the yeast strains that you used. I mean, these are yeast strains that I think everybody who's listening to the show is going to be familiar with and probably have brewed with. Um, so you had the uh, Lalbrew Nottingham, um, the BRY 97, uh, which is the Chico strain, uh, Windsor, London, a Wit, which was previously branded as Munich, um, and then Munich Classic, Diamond, Belle Saison, and Abbey all obtained from Lalamont. So I think these are um, all yeast strains that people have used to brew with before uh, and, and very common brewing strains out there. Um, and then so you rehydrated the yeast before pitching. But again, these are dry yeast for the reasons that we talked about just before the break. Um, fermented them at room temperature, so between 20 to 25 Celsius or 70 to 78 Fahrenheit. And then did a whole bunch of different measurements on them, um, which is cool. And we're going to get into those results. The measurements were like uh, fermentation kinetics, and you did this by mass, um, which we'll talk about. Uh, you did uh, HPLC. You measured the actual concentration of organic acids, glucose, maltose, maltotriose, and ethanol, and then also pH um, and total acidity. And then one of the coolest parts of this um, is that you – I don't know if this was an add-on or not, but I like this, that you did like a bottle conditioning aspect of it, right? Because, you know, even if you're you're not even if you're doing your alcoholic fermentation first and then letting beer sit in a barrel or something and develop acetic and lactic acid over time, once you move it out of the barrel, you got to carbonate it. And a very common way of doing that is in bottle conditioning, right? So you're pitching yeast into a sour or lactic acid or acetic acid concentrated beer. Um, so I really appreciated this. So this was testing bottle conditioning. Um, uh, yeah. Uh, and so we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that uh, in a minute too. But first of all, I wanted to talk about um, the relationship between pH and total acidity, because that's something that you met that you measured. And I think it's important for us to understand here. So can you help us explain this? Why is total acidity important for sour beers and not just pH? That's uh, also a really good question. In fact, I would like to take this moment to, um, I think what I'll do as well for the listeners, kind of give them a visual aid. I will send you um, a chart or a graph that I made using 72, 76 uh, data points that kind of demonstrate this. This was, um, this was comparing concentration of lactic acid uh, directly to pH. And you'll see this really interesting plateau effect. Um, <clears throat> so beer is a very complex medium. The wort in particular is full of all kinds of um, chemical compounds. So you have uh, complex tannins and proteins and starches, sugars, different kinds of sugars, different kinds of carbohydrates, vitamins, minerals, um, all kinds of stuff just being extracted during the during the mashing process. And all of those have some kind of impact on the pH of the wort. And 
um, impact the final cons- or the final impact or the final pH of the beer in part due to metabolic and functional and chemical changes done by the fermentation process. Um, this is all to say that wort and beer in general have a buffering capacity and just kind of a quick review into organic chemistry or chemistry in general, buffering can just be thought of as, or buffering capacity can be thought of the ability of a compound or, or, uh, sorry, a, uh, liquids resistance to pH change. Um, so <clears throat> pH alone will just give you the ion activity, the hydronium activity, as we were talking about earlier, whereas the total acidity will give you the actual quantitative value of how much organic acid or how much acid in general is present in solution. And those do not correlate. I see. So so they don't correlate. So so the at, at some point, your pH because of the buffering capacity of the wort is going to flatten out, but the lactic acid concentration, for example, can be linear, right? I mean, you're just, you know, dosing yeah. in yeah. lactic acid, right? Mm-hmm. But the, but the, if you, if you had a visual graph of the pH, if you're measuring the pH as you add lactic acid, it's not going to be a linear change, the pH yeah. change. Yeah. Um, and for, for listeners that have taken probably like, you know, um, college chemistry course you've probably done that with titrations uh usually like uh so something many organic acids are polyprotic so they'll have more than one proton um and you can actually like visualize where each proton will dissociate based upon uh where plateaus end and um the ph change starts to be or uh starts up again based upon uh your titration scheme yeah so it's it's pretty cool yeah, it's fun. And I think that that is an important part of as we go through these results, because, again, you know, the the acidity um, in this is something that you're dosing in, right? You're dosing in the the um, acid here. But looking at the pH change alone uh, doesn't necessarily make much sense because it's not the pH that's impacting the yeast. It's the actual presence of the lactic acid uh, that, that's impacting the yeast. And so I wanted to start yes. with um, attenuation. So let's start with attenuation. We'll split this up between lactic and acetic acid. Um, and attenuation, of course, is, is how was the ability of the yeast to take sugar and turn it into alcohol um, or, or to use the sugars, right? Um, so what did you mm-hmm. see in terms of uh, attenuation with lactic acid present? Uh, so attenuation was somewhat impacted, uh, with lactic acid. One of the first things that we saw was impacted was maltotriose uptake and metabolism. Uh, so as we increased lactic acid concentrations, we saw that there was lower uptake or lower use of the, of maltotriose. And this was quantified using HPLC. And so <clears throat> we were able to, um, watch essentially in real time that uh, the more acidic or the more lactic acid that was present, um, the maltotriose use was impacted, therefore lowering um, ethanol yield. Hmm. Interesting. So yeah, well th- that's that's interesting. And, and so the some so all of the yeasts then um, or even the ones that would normally use uh, maltotriose uh, had their ethanol yield reduced. I guess that's a, well. Let me let me back up. Let me say that differently. So some of the yeast strains that you tested are known. Are, in fact, most of them are known for using for their ability to use maltotriose. But there were a couple right. that don't have that ability to use maltotriose that are known for that. Correct. Um, and, and so um, those ones that that don't have that ability. Um, I guess then maybe weren't impacted by the yeast because they they uh, didn't they didn't lose the ability to ferment maltotriose or am I off base here? Exactly. Yeah. So like the Windsor and the London brands, um, those are known to not be very efficient with maltotriose. In fact, like that's why London is popular um, for use in say lower ABV beers. Mm-hmm. Um, because of that, uh, you know, in in a standard wort, you could think of maltotriose as making up of upwards of say fourteen percent of the fermentable sugars. You know, if, you, if you're not using 
that 14%, that's, that can impact, you know, that'll have a big impact on final attenuation. Um, Bell Cezanne was another one, but although Bell Cezanne is an, it's an interesting case in that it is STA positive. So it is producing a beta glucoamylase and excreting it. Um, so at those pHs, now we, we, we can backtrack a little bit because like, you know, what, what you said, like pH doesn't really matter for, and, and it's more of uh, the concentration of, of um, the acids. Uh, I mean, that's like a case-by-case -case basis because pH does in fact matter. pH, the activity, the relative activity of your hydrogen ions um, or your hydronium ions will impact, say, like um, optimum activity of certain enzymes. Um, so that is more of like uh, an electrochemical sort of thing because it impacts like how how the enzymes fold, etc. But you know <laughs> that's an entire lecture for another day, <laughs> right? Um, <laughs> yeah. But for our purposes, yeah. So we can think of as like the beta glucamylase that Bell Cezanne produces um, is active into very low pHs, so it'll just keep, keep breaking down those starches and those sugars, even maltotriose into glucose yeah. so the bell season really won't have much of an issue because like okay even if it's maltotriose uptake is take uh is impacted mm -hmm. it's, it's still able to passively take up glucose quite quite well right 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 because it's got the uh, it's got that active um enzyme and so yeah I, yeah I see what you're saying right like ph does impact other things right ph impacts enzymatic activity because some enzymes work at certain phs and some of them don't <laughs> right mm -hmm. they they have different functions at different phs um and, and so yeah that that makes sense and bell saison has this glucoamylase um at, at the you know the sta1 the diastatic um you know gene that makes it uh, ability that makes it a really it convert those longer chain sugars into, like you said, glucose um, that that it can um, easily assimilate. So that makes sense. So Windsor, London, and Bel Cezanne, um, they they attenuated up like as normal because Windsor and London don't readily consume maltotriose. So the other yeast that had their maltotriose functions impaired, um, you know, it didn't really impact them. And Bel Cezanne, because it's got this extra amylase out there, it's going to be able to chew through maltotriose anyway, even if it was, you know, it, it, it you know, it doesn't necessarily need to have a maltotriose assimilation because it's got this <laughs> this enzyme that will break down maltotriose and other sugars into glucose anyway. Is that right? That is a good succinct description. Okay. Yeah. Well, hopefully, um, and hopefully that makes sense uh, <laughs> to people. Uh, it makes sense to me. Uh, but so then that's that's interesting. And like you said, all of the other strains saw this, um, you know, reduction in attenuation with increased lactic acid concentrations. That just means like the yeast aren't as capable of assimilating those sugars and turning them into alcohol in the presence of higher concentrations of lactic acid, which I think is makes sense, right? I mean, uh, that's one of the things that we're talking about with the bioethanol industry, that they see higher concentrate, that they see concentrations of lactic acid impacting yeast. So that's a very easy one and a very quick one to understand is that, yeah, lactic acid is actually impacting fermentation performance for most yeast strains at high concentrations. Well, what about um, acetic acid? Yeah, so acetic acid seems to have a much higher impact on overall ferment fermentation performance. Um, and again, like we also saw the same kind of behavior with uh, with Windsor and London, where there really wasn't much of a change in attenuation between or at at all of the increments that we've added, whereas like the other strains that we looked at, the other brands that we looked at, um, saw a pretty high impact on total attenuation or percent attenuation uh, when when impacted by or sorry, when influenced by uh, acetic acid. Um, so the thing that physiologically speaking, uh, that this, and, and again, like th this could be its own um, paper uh, or its own study. Um, but what we believe is happening is that lactic acid and acetic acid are capable of possibly passively diffusing into 
yeast cytoplasm. And one of the things that we learn early on in biology is the importance of the cell membrane. And the cell membrane is there you know, to give structure, to give body to a cell, but it also kind of separates the rest of the universe from the inside of the cell. The inside of the cell needs to be maintained at a very tight pH range. So typically, I mean, depending on the organism, depending on the species, we could say like about 7 to 7.2 pH. And this is very important for proper metabolic functions, for proper enzyme and protein folding. Um, so the yeast will work very hard to make sure that that pH is maintained. And what we believe is happening is, um, one, the pH change and the specific chemistry involved with each individual organic acid or the with their individual organic acids are, one, disrupting uh, proton symport. So this is an important mechanism that uh, cells will use to allow sugars and other nutrients to be brought in inside the cell. Um, and that disrupts the complex uh, behavior required for maltotriose uptake. Maltotriose is a very complex uptake, and which is why it's usually one of the first, um, one of the first, I guess, abilities that yeast will lose uh, due to mutations. Because that is, and again, this is like a whole other, <laughs> yeah. whole other topic, but that's a hallmark of domestication. Maltotriose doesn't really exist in nature. This is a man-made carbohydrate. Mm -hmm. um, so there's really no need for wild yeast to be able to uptake maltotriose because it just really doesn't exist. However, um, it's kind of like, you, you can think of like uh, how dogs have acquired multiple copies of amylase genes that their wild cousins, wolves, don't have because dogs, having lived with humans for the last, I don't know, 40,000 to 10,000 years, um, started incorporating more grain into their diet. And uh, uh, having multiple copies of an amylase gene to break down starches in their mouth and in their, in their saliva and gut is more advantageous than if you're a wolf. Um, so it's kind of like that with here. Domesticated yeast have multiple trials uptake. However, it's a very delicate system, mm -hmm. typically the first to go in, yeah. um, in these kinds of scenarios. And then just the metabolic costs of maintaining and trying to maintain that internal pH at the level that it's needed costs a lot of energy. So yeah. um, total, total attenuation, the percent attenuation could be severely impacted by that because the yeast is like, okay, you know what? Uh, we need to start shunting energy to you know, pumping out these protons, pumping out this lactic acid, pumping out this uh, acetic acid uh, because it's really messing up it's really messing up my guts. So, you know, yeah. I got to concentrate on this. <laughs> yeah, exactly. They have to use their, the spin their energy to get rid of the lactic and acetic acid that's like in their cells, right? <laughs> in, yeah. Inside their body. And they got to be like, get this out of here. So they have to take energy. Adapt. Yeah. Away from mm -hmm. that. Exactly. And, and then they can't, um, they don't have enough energy for the maltotriose. That's really interesting. Um, and that's a really interesting topic for, for, for further study. Um, if somebody's going to look at that, or maybe you are um, <laughs> going to look at that as well, Avi. But that's really cool. And that really does explain a lot of the results that you saw in terms of fermentation, right? You saw, Or in terms of attenuation. You did see decreases um, you know, generally across most of the strains because they lose this ability uh, to assimilate maltotriose. And one of the coolest parts about this too is you're able to see this uh, very clearly because you did HPLC analysis of the sugar concentration, right? You look at glucose, maltose, and maltotriose, um, and you can see what sugars are actually taken up by the yeast. So one of the things that I found interesting was that 
you showed that all of the strains fermented maltose triose at all levels of lactic acid, except that Nottingham seemed a little bit susceptible. It was impacted um, at concentrations of lactic acid above 0.6%. Um, and so, mm-hmm. so I guess that means that lactic acid seems to have a strong impact on maltotriose, but maybe not as strong on yeast's ability to take up the shorter chains like maltose and glucose. Is that right? Yeah, exactly. Um, because, and again, like w- we've been able to ferment, we, we've been able to ferment, albeit not very well, um, at pHs as low as two uh, with these with these yeast. I mean, this is just kind of like looking at at some side side projects. Um, so the yeasts are are capable, um, and this probably has more to do with glucose use. But one of the things that that you know, one of the follow ups that we could possibly do is kind of correlate like, hey, like, hey maybe um, we can look at ethanol production in, um, say, a pure glucose solution. Well, obviously, you know, with the with the with added nitrogen for <laughs> right for nutrients, but like a more heavily digested um, uh, wort. Mm-hmm. You know, something yeah. that's been treated extensively with with enzymes to really break down those sugars. Yeah, what would happen if you still if you put those put yeast in those in that situation, right? And then yeah. added acid, how would it change? Yeah, because we do know, like looking at Nottingham and stuff for say a use in hard seltzers and hard seltzer fermentation, uh, Nottingham does fine. Like it's it's really you know as long as it's provided with the right nutrients um those ph's drop like crazy if you don't buffer your solution carbonic acid effect yeah um i mean you can you can go from like a ph of um say like a starting ph of six all the way down to below three wow. uh in less in less than 24 hours just because <laughs> <laughs> again you're dealing with water you're not dealing with wort and um wort has a lot of buffering capacity that uh, even adjusted water or you know water that's been provided mixed in with with nutrients can't do. Yeah, 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 and that but make- you're just dealing with glucose. Yeah, exactly. You're just dealing with glucose, right? It's not maltotriose that's being required or maltose that's being required to be up to uh, to to be uptaken uptook uh, either way <laughs> yeah um, <laughs> yeah i don't know <laughs> whichever one <laughs> um uh but you you uh stated this really well in the paper and you said malto trios uptake was severely impacted relative to maltose uptake even at low uh acid constant low lactic acid concentrations you said the exception being london and windsor but this was expected because those two strains uh lack the ability to take up malto trios bell saison however maintained the ability to use maltotriose up to even 0.5 percent uh, acetic acid which was the highest level um, of acetic acid so this is kind of that whole thing that we've been talking about right it's like the maltotriose uptake seems to be what's really being impacted by acids um, london and windsor don't even have the ability to uptake maltotriose so those two strains we don't expect them to be impacted by losing the ability <laughs> that they don't have um and bel saison has that extra glucoamylase um and so that helps it break down the sugars into maltose and, and and glucose and it's really interesting to think about this in the way that you said right it's all about energy it's about the energy spend maltotriose requires more energy than glucose and maltose requires for the yeast to assimilate Yep. Cool. All right. Last part of the study then uh, was bottle conditioning. Um, and this was cool, right? Um, uh, I I love this. I don't know. Was it an afterthought? I, I hope it wasn't an afterthought. I hope it was like baked into the study, but it does seem like oh, to yeah, me yeah, it was like, yeah. to me it was like, oh, duh. Of course we should bottle condition these beers, right? Because that's that's like, it's going to happen every time um, that you're doing some sort of, uh, you know, if you're in bottle conditioning, bottling a sour beer, you're going to expose yeast to acid. It makes a lot of sense. Um, and mm-hmm. one of the three things I wanted to ask, uh, so you, you, you took the beer, um, you put it in um, uh, bottles, or I'm sorry, you took the wort solution and you put it in bottles and then you added concentrations of lactic, the same lactic and acetic, so the same concentrations, um, and then uh, put those into the bottle but didn't um, purge the headspace. So there's oxygen in the bottle. And I wanted to ask about like why not purge the headspace. Is that because of what we were talking about that acetic acid requires oxygen or is it something different? No. So th- that was mostly just due to the limitations of the equipment that we had ah. um, for this process. Um, 
So it's we 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 left as little headspace as possible, um, but okay. you still want like some headspace, uh, just just for any pressure that builds up. Um, but yeah, that was just that's just a, a a clarification because one we weren't really concerned too much about the sensory of the beer we just wanted to make sure that um whatever gas could dissolve into you know or or like whatever extra secondary co2 could be formed would be able to redissolve back into into solution just to see if we could get that satisfying hiss when we (laughs) pop the bottles well right Um, right but nobody's drinking those beers, right? Yeah, nobody's drinking the uh, you know half a percent acetic acid or or you know <laughs> yeah yeah. <laughs> so it really wasn't there for sensory; it was just there for more of a um, functional test. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and so what did you? Oh, and then also the other thing too is you added the champagne or the um, I think it's the champagne yeast, the CBC one um, yeast variety that I think you guys are, are recommend for bottle conditioning. Um, that one was, mm-hmm. uh, that what you used that yeast as well. Um, and that one was more sensitive to acetic than lactic like the other ones, but it still seems like it did a hell of a good job. It still conditioned yeah. the beer, even at the highest act- lactic, um, uh, levels. Yeah. Uh, CBC one's a pretty cool yeast. It was isolated from a very tough environment. So it's, it's a survivor. Um, so this is something that, that can, has been shown to, survive for multiple years in under um you know bottled conditions um so it was we were never really quite sure like what how robust it was Mm -hmm. but we knew that it was pretty robust not something we would recommend making an actual beer with although it can um but again, this is this the lineage of this yeast is also it's kind of like it's not very good at uptaking multiple trials itself. It's more of a glucose uh, uptake, kind of uh, fructophilic as well. Uh, so it could do well with sucrose, but um, you know, a high adjunct beer maybe. But yeah, this is it's much more suited for actual bottle conditioning, yeah, rather than beer fermentation. Yeah, when we're just going to add in some table sugar, or some corn sugar, or something like that um, to yeah. to to get it where it can ferment those those sugars well that's did you do the? was it just that yeast that you did with bottle conditioning or was it all the yeasts that you did with bottle conditioning? Uh, no, just just that one yeah that's what yeah. i thought um but that's cool to see that that yeast still survives um and and you can still bottle condition sour beers i mean i've had a bunch of questions several questions over the years uh through the brewlosophy podcast asking about sour and if you can bottle condition sour beers and i'm and because you know the ph is low or whatever and i'm always like yes yes you can <laughs> and like i've seen lots of people do it it's been done for hundreds of years belgian gooses and lambics and everything yeah, you yeah. know have been bottle conditioned exactly. uh for for long periods of time so somehow the yeast is surviving in those um, highly acidic uh, conditions. Oh, even champagne. Yeah, champagne. There you go, right? Champagne's that's, a very acidic environment. Yeah, that, that's exactly right. With all that carbonic acid and, and, and everything, I mean, the pH is gonna is low on champagne already. Um, so yeah, mm-hmm. I mean, I can certainly see it. Uh, with some big takeaways from this episode then, um, so acetic acid was more detrimental to brewer's yeast than lactic acid, but brewer's yeast still performs fairly well. At least, um, you know, they, they did lose some ability to ferment maltotriose, but they still were able to ferment wort um, under acidic conditions, which I think is really, really, um, really interesting. And the three yeasts that we talked about uh, the most were, were Windsor, London, and, and Belle Saison, right? Windsor and London didn't show a huge impact because they don't have the ability to take up maltotriose, and Belle Saison has that um, glucoamylase that they can excre- excrete uh, that sort of insulates them from being from having to ferment maltotriose. But that maltotriose piece of this is really interesting, and that seems to be what was directly impacted, um, at least in terms of acid concentration, uh, with lactic acid and acetic acid in these words. Um, so it, w- amidst all of those things that we talked about, Avi, if you want brewers to take away just one thing from today's episode, what would it be? I guess wort composition is probably going to be your most important thing if you're going to be making a sour beer, um, as well as choosing the right yeast for it. It seems to be that, like, given the huge genetic diversity that we have within Saccharomyces cerevisiae alone. Um, I think like no matter what, no matter what you choose, it'll probably do fine. Um, but 
yeah, really, the, I guess the key takeaway is to kind of uh, make sure if you're going to be doing a sour beer, probably do more of a low and slow mash rather than a fast and furious mash, I guess, because you really want the, you really want that glucose. You want that maltose. You kind of want probably a lower portion of, of uh, maltotriose specifically for that. But all things considered, um, it seems to be like, yeah, yeast, the yeast selection itself probably not as important mm-hmm. yeah they just they, depending on your targets they're still going to perform reasonably well right yeah like you said yeah. depending on your targets right we're not using these for bioethanol <laughs> at least exactly at least nobody yeah. that i know <laughs> we're not trying to maximize uh you know dollar per per gram of glucose exactly um yeah and i don't think you will ever encounter a situation where you're going to pre-acidify your wort with acetic acid <laughs> but that's if that's true. all you got <laughs> right there may be like like i said maybe in the bottle conditioning example with the beer that's been in a tank you know or in a barrel for a while uh you know maybe that has some acetic acid in it because of whatever yeah. the barrel microbiome is but um <laughs> You know, uh, but then, uh, but yeah, you should check out our other episode, episode 15 on uh, the barrel myco and microbiome to see if that's something that would be interesting. Uh, but that's uh, we, we talked about quite a bit, Avi. And uh, so I, I think uh, I think we got through everything that we needed to. But is there anything else that you uh, wanted to share about the study that we didn't get to today? I guess not about the study in particular, but I thought that this was a pretty good uh, distillation um, of practical research into a format that's approachable to everybody. Like that's one of the things that, you know, I'm, I really like about the brewing community is people are very open about sharing knowledge um, and, and are very inquisitive. Uh, I get, I get a lot of emails all the time um, asking uh, for specific advice about this and that. Sometimes I can't provide the answer, unfortunately, but um, it's just, it's just really nice to kind of have this kind of engagement. So this is something that I that I appreciate as a food scientist. Well, I'm glad. I love it. And I love sharing this content content with people and having guests like you on the show that are doing this fun research, right? Looking at how uh, acids, lactic and acetic acid impact different yeast strains. And so Avi, thank you again uh, for joining me in the brew lab. And I got to get you back to talk about sour vicier, um and, and, and some of the other topics and fun, uh, uh, fun research that you've been doing <laughs> at Lalamond. Sure. No problem. All right. Well, listeners, in the show notes, you'll find a link to Avi's article, which is titled The Impact of Lactic and Acetic Acid on Primary Beer Fermentation Performance and Secondary Refermentation During Bottle Conditioning with Active Dry Yeast. This was published in the Journal of the American Society of Brewing Chemists in September 2021. So if you enjoy this content, please leave a review wherever it is that you listen to podcasts. And don't forget to check out our other show, The Brewlosophy Podcast. The Brew Lab is a production of Brewlosophy, where they who drink beer think beer. Don't forget to visit Brewlosophy.com to read about our weekly experiments and other brewing adventures and listen to us talk about it on our other show, The Brewlosophy Podcast. Thanks to all of our sponsors and patrons that help make this show possible. If you'd like to receive a reward for helping us do what we do, visit Patreon.com slash Brewlosophy to see how you can do just that. Thanks so much for listening. We'll be back in the Brew Lab with another guest next week. Until then, think beer. Looking for a fun way to win up to 25 times your money this basketball season? Test your skills on Prize Picks, the most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. Just select two or more players, pick more or less on their projected stats, and place your entry. You could turn $10 into $250. Right now, Prize Picks will match your first deposit up to $100. Just visit prizepicks.com/fan and use code FAN. That's code FAN at prizepicks.com/fan. Must be present in certain states. Visit prizepicks.com for restrictions and details.